Before we get into today's stories, visit dreadsarmy.com to sign up for the Dread Weekly newsletter so you don't miss out on any updates. Also, check out all of the channels in the Dread Network on dreadsarmy.com or in the description below. Thanks for listening. Now let's get to the stories. I worked as a volunteer for search and rescue in my area. I lived near a popular hiking area on the east side of the Rocky Mountains, so we would often get out-of-state hikers who were woefully unprepared for mountain weather and terrain. Normally, we would be able to find the person and get them home safe, but we have some pretty dangerous wildlife out here, and while they don't often go after humans, they'll make quick work of a body if something were to happen to you out there. If you fell down a rocky hill and broke your leg, a bear might see you as an easy meal, and in a couple of days, there'd be nothing left. No trace whatsoever. If someone goes missing out here and we can't find them, it's probably because the wildlife found them first. Or at least that what I've always been told. I'm not sure what to believe anymore. My revelation comes from a season where we had three hikers all go missing, without a trace around the same area. They were individual cases, no connection between them, and they happened several weeks apart. I was part of the horseback search team. They liked to have us on horseback because we could cover more ground and traverse rough terrain a lot easier than we could on foot. A lot of us riders in the area end up doing this on a volunteer basis just as something to do, but that's not really important to the story. I got really familiar with the area after doing three extensive searches that season. All of the missing hikers were reported as likely wildlife fatalities. There was a large cave system nearby, and the police were convinced we were dealing with a predatory bear that lived in the area, though they were unable to find it. I wasn't convinced. I was pretty good friends with one of the lead officers from Fish and Wildlife. He told me that bears don't typically live in caves. In fact, no large predators do. Sometimes they'll take up temporary residence in a cave, but even when searching for hibernation spots, bears tend to burrow in a side hill. He didn't think we were dealing with a bear. Something might live in those caves, he said, but it isn't a bear. We organized the team to do one last search around the caves before officially calling it off. I remember it well. There was no sign of the missing hiker, or any of the missing hikers for that matter, but we did the search anyway. We organized in grids so we wouldn't be overlapping. My section of the grid was the one nearest to the caves, but I wasn't concerned. I was on horseback and I was carrying a sidearm in the event I ran into any combative wildlife. My horse never much liked that area, but we had been over there so many times that year, I thought she was finally getting used to it. She was on edge that night. She wasn't outwardly nervous, but I could tell she thought something there wasn't right. In hindsight, I should have listened to her. It was around dusk when we were on our way out that I heard something in one of the caves as we passed by. It sounded like someone threw a rock down the cave, but I didn't see anything. I asked, who's there, but received no response. A moment later, in the darkness of the cave, I saw two eyes emerge. My first thought was bear, or mountain lion, so I grabbed my gun and pointed it at the mouth of the cave. I told whatever it was to stay in there, not expecting it could understand me, but oftentimes if wild animals hear humans, they'll steer clear. But if this really was the rogue predatory bear that was killing these hikers, I was likely in trouble. My horse was fidgety and nervous now, and I couldn't blame her. I could tell she wanted to bolt and run, but I didn't want the creature in the cave to chase us if it didn't already have a mind to. It blinked at us in the darkness and slowly emerged from its rocky home. What I saw at the mouth of the cave left me speechless. I expected to see some kind of animal. Something covered in fur, but this was far from that. It looked like a little human, almost ghoul-like. It was bald and pale as the moonlight shining above. Its limbs were spindly and appeared too long for its body. Its legs had strange angles to them, almost as if they were a morph of human legs and those of a dog. The creature moved awkwardly, but I imagine if it wanted to run, it could move pretty damn fast with those hind legs. Its face was the worst part. I mean, seriously, I can't even properly describe it to you. It was like looking at a skull. Imagine it. Its nose was just two slits on its face. And those eyes, oh man, 
those dark eyes took up just about its entire head. The way it stared at me sent chills down my spine. It looked like some sort of demon, something out of a horror film. It hissed at me when it saw me, and I am not ashamed to admit I was scared out of my wits. Without thinking, I took a shot at it, but who knows if it hit. I mean the creature retreated into the cave so quickly I couldn't tell if the shot landed or not. There was no way I was sticking around to see if it was going to come back out. I was out of there like a bat out of hell. Once I got back to my truck, my hands were still shaking, and I called up my friend from Fish and Wildlife. I told him straight up that I saw something in the cave a moment ago, and that it wasn't a bear. I expected him to laugh or make some joke, but he was pretty cryptic in his response. He told me about the unsolved missing person cases near large cave systems, and how there's all this speculation about what the correlation is, if there even is one. The way he talked about it was chilling, I tell you. He mentioned that the police didn't know about it, but most park rangers did. He even said that half the time they are sent out to dispatch a dangerous bear, it turns out to be something else entirely. Something that isn't a bear at all. I could tell he was serious, and he told me to go home, assuring me that he'll take care of it. And that was that. It was like an unspoken agreement between us to never talk about it again. But I'll admit, it's something that's haunted me ever since. Every time I drive by that area or hear about another missing person, I can't help but think about that creature and what it might really be. It's one of those things, you know? The more you think about it, the more it gets to you. It's left me with more questions than answers. What was that thing? Why did my friend from Fish and Wildlife seem to know about it? And why don't they tell the police? But I guess some things are just better left unknown. All I know is I'll never look at caves or wild animals the same way again. I still have dreams about those dark, soulless eyes staring at me from the shadows of that cave. It's an experience I wouldn't wish on anyone, and something I'll never forget. No way, no how. A few months ago, we got a new security system for our house that included two mounted cameras. One was on the doorbell, and another was a motion sensor camera that looked out over the backyard. We didn't live in a bad area or anything, but people stealing packages off of porches wasn't unheard of, and we ordered a lot of stuff from Amazon. We also had two dogs, and when the camera detected motion, we got a notification. Soon our dogs figured out they could activate the backyard sensor to let us know that they wanted back inside. We had a huge yard in a rural area, so we let them out to run around the yard whenever they wanted. This new system worked out well, at least until something started tripping our camera at all hours of the night. The little dinging notification would wake me or my husband up a few times a week, and it drove us crazy. At first, we just turned our phones off at night, once the dogs were inside. But we were definitely still curious about what was out there. We tried watching the video, but the quality wasn't great in the dark, and we never saw anything clearly. Sometimes we thought we saw a blur at the edge of the yard, but it could have been a shadow or anything really. So, we gave up and started to ignore the notifications. A month later, one of our dogs came home injured. He had some bloody scratches and bite mark punctures. He was whimpering like crazy, and we freaked out. We rushed him to the vet to get him all patched up. Luckily, he was gonna be okay, but the vet gave him a bunch of shots, just in case. When we asked what could have done it, the vet was stumped. He said the bite marks were vaguely canine, but too big to be a domestic dog. They didn't quite match anything he was familiar with. For a while after that, we were really careful about keeping the dogs close to the house. We always watched them when they were in the yard, and we didn't let them stay out long. We also noticed that our dog that had been attacked had no interest in getting too far from the house. We talked about different ideas, like fencing in a smaller area, but the dogs were energetic and loved being able to run. We decided to wait and see if anything else happened. It had been months without an incident, so we started cautiously letting them stay out longer and not watching them every second. We were hoping it had been a freak occurrence, and for a while, it seemed fine. But then one evening, a little before dusk, we heard them barking like crazy. We nervously ran outside and called to them. 
At first, they didn't come to us and they stayed at the edge of our property, barking and growling at something we couldn't see. We keep calling them and it took a while, but eventually they did come. That night, I left my phone volume up. I don't know why, but I just wanted to know if something was out there after all especially if it was whatever had previously attacked our dog. I couldn't sleep and kept alternating watching out the window and keeping an eye on the security system app. By 1 a.m., nothing had come past, so I relaxed and fell asleep. Luckily, when the ding sounded on my phone, I was only half asleep. I shot up and grabbed my phone. I looked at the video and saw that dark blur again. Something was out there. I was sure of it now. I woke my husband and he grabbed a baseball bat because that was all we had. And we both slowly went downstairs without turning on any lights. We looked out the back door window and watched for the black blur. We didn't turn on the light because we didn't want to scare anything away or alert it to us being there before we got a good look. It took about 10 minutes before we saw it move, but there it was, big and dark, walking way down at the far edge of the property. And when I say walking, I mean walking upright, like a person. Not on all fours. It was so weird. We had been expecting an animal, but wondered if it was a person after all. Maybe someone lurking around, looking for stuff to steal. I'd been sure that the thing that had attacked our dog was the same thing in the backyard, but now I was confused. Did we have a dangerous wild animal on the loose and a creepy guy? What were the odds of having both? We kept watching hoping to get a better look so we could tell the police something useful if we needed to. Eventually, it came closer to the house, just close enough for us to see it in the moonlight. We saw fur, fur everywhere. The person, or thing, was tall, really tall, but covered in fur. It didn't make any sense. It was coming closer to the house now. If it came any closer, I planned to turn on the back floodlight and see it. It took a few minutes, but it did come close enough. I reached over and flipped the light switch, flooding the backyard with light. The thing screeched and turned and ran, but not before we saw it clearly. We saw the tall, dark, furry body, and also the face, the horrible face. It was dog-like, with a canine-looking snout and long, sharp teeth. The most terrifying aspect was the eyes, reddish-orange and glowing as they glared straight at us before running off. The thing had looked like a demonic dog, but also a person. We called the police and animal control, but once we explained how we had seen this strange creature walking around with glowing eyes, they seemed to discount our story. We even sort of thought we were crazy too. How could this thing really exist? We got a half-hearted promise from the police that they would search the woods and set some traps, but we could tell that it probably would never happen, and they never did come back to update us. Luckily, that thing hasn't come back either, at least not yet. Hey there, I'm Jake. At the time of this story, I was in my 20s and living in Central Florida. I always enjoyed exploring unknown places and searching for things that defied ordinary explanation. That led me to the Everglades in Florida a place I had always wanted to visit because it is so steeped in mystery and folklore. The Everglades are famous for their sprawling wetlands, mysterious marshes, and dense mangrove forests. But among the locals, they're also known for something more sinister, a place where strange and unexplained occurrences have been reported for generations. I decided to head to there after hearing stories about an unidentified creature spotted in the area. Some people called it a mere alligator, but others swore that it was something more ominous, something otherworldly. Intrigued, I planned my trip during the fall, when the swamps are supposedly at their most eerie. When I first arrived, the feeling was instant. I couldn't shake the feeling that I had stepped into another world. The air was thick with humidity, clinging to my skin. Tall, moss-covered trees loomed overhead and the ever-present chorus of insects buzzed in my ears. I took my time getting to know the area. The wetlands stretched out before me, a maze of waterways and thick vegetation. I could see alligators lazily swimming in the murky waters, their eyes just above the surface, watching. Birds of every color took flight as I made my way deeper into the marshes. 
and the sound of unseen creatures rustled in the underbrush. I set up camp near a large clearing, where the trees gave way to a wide open view of the sky. The first night passed uneventfully, but I couldn't shake my strange feeling. It was as if the swamp was alive. During the day, I explored the dense mangrove forests, getting lost more than once. I stumbled upon hidden pockets of beauty. I even found evidence of the native wildlife, tracks of raccoons and signs of other creatures that called the Everglades home. But mixed with the natural beauty was something unsettling. I would catch fleeting glimpses of movement out of the corner of my eye, shadows that didn't quite align with the wind's movement, sounds that didn't quite fit with the normal sounds of the swamp. By the end of the first day, my sense of adventure had been tinged with a feeling of unease. The Everglades were hiding something, and I could feel it in my bones. It all began around midnight. The moon was hidden behind a thick layer of clouds, and I was navigating through the wetlands with my flashlight. The only sound was the occasional splash of water or the distant hoot of an owl. I remember coming across a clearing, and that's when I saw it. At first, I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me. The darkness of the night and the shadowy terrain could mess with your mind, after all. But standing there just a few feet away was something enormous and unmistakably real. Its face was like that of an alligator, yet twisted and unnatural, as if sculpted by some dark force. Those yellow, piercing eyes seemed to glow in the dim light, locking onto mine with an intelligence that was both alien and terrifying. They were not just the eyes of a predator. They held something deeper, a malicious cunning that seemed to stare into my very soul. The creature's body was an odd fusion of reptilian features. It was covered in coarse, uneven scales that glistened in the pale moonlight. Its limbs were thick and muscular, yet they seemed out of proportion, giving its movements a strange and awkward gait. Despite standing upright, it retained a hunched posture, as if it were not quite used to this form. Its long tail trailed behind, thrashing slowly as if it had a mind of its own. Its evil eyes never left mine as it seemed to consider me, sizing me up, evaluating whether I was prey or something more. I couldn't move. I couldn't breathe. I was trapped in those haunting, unblinking eyes, paralyzed by a mixture of fear and fascination. Its jaw opened slightly, revealing rows of sharp, predatory teeth. I could hear a low growl, a sound that resonated in my chest. The air around us seemed to grow colder. It shifted its weight, muscles rippling under the scales, and I could see the sheer power contained within its form. Despite its awkward appearance, there was no doubt that it could move with terrifying speed if it chose to. Every rational thought told me to run, to flee from this impossible being, but my feet were rooted to the spot. All I could do was stare back, locked in a silent duel. Part of me wanted to run, to flee from this entity that seemed to have stepped out of some nightmare. My instinct screamed at me to put as much distance between myself and the creature as possible. Yet another part of me was inexplicably captivated by its presence. It was a fascination that went beyond mere curiosity. It was a profound connection that I couldn't shake. Though it represented everything unknown and terrifying, there was something in its eyes that held me. I stood there, caught in a struggle between fear and fascination. The minutes felt like hours, each second stretching into eternity as we stared at each other, locked in a silent communion. I was drawn deeper into those haunting eyes, the rest of the world falling away until there was nothing but the creature and me. Then, almost as suddenly as it had appeared, the creature finally turned away. It began to move, lumbering into the darkness with its awkward, shambling gait. Its movements were slow at first, deliberate and measured, as if it were reluctant to break the connection. But gradually it picked up pace, its form growing fainter and fainter until it was swallowed by the swamp. As I finally began to move, the sounds of the swamp slowly returning to my ears, I realized that I had been given a glimpse into a world that few have ever seen. I returned to camp, but sleep was impossible. The following day, I went back and tried to find traces of the creature, but there was nothing. No footprints, no signs, no evidence. I left the Everglades with more questions than answers. The experience stayed with me, haunting me. 
People may dismiss my story, but I know what I saw. The Everglades hold secrets, and I had stumbled upon one of them. That creature, whatever it was, will always be etched in my memory, a chilling reminder to embrace the wonder and terror of our extraordinary world. I was headed toward my car on the last leg of my evening jog. I preferred jogging at the state park near my house instead of the road. I had seen one too many pedestrian accidents in my community to feel safe running on the roads in the evening hours. Although, after my experience in the park, I don't feel safe running there anymore either. I don't typically jog late at night, but my shift ran a little longer than usual. I will say that the park is a little more remote than is probably safe for night adventures. I haven't seen any weird people there after dark, but we do have quite a robust wildlife population in the area. Think, bears, cougars, wolves, moose. I was smart about it. I carried bear spray and made sure to play music on my phone when I was out after dark. Most animals in my experience will stay away from you if they hear you coming. I was maybe two miles from the car when I stopped to take a breather. I grabbed some water from my pack and decided to walk for a moment. The sun had set, but there was still some light left. I wasn't worried yet, but I knew I had to keep moving if I wanted to get out of there before dark. All of a sudden, an orange light shone behind me. It was like the sun came out for a moment. I knew there was nothing out there that could make a light that bright. It definitely wasn't someone's flashlight or even headlights from a vehicle. It was as bright as the sun. The whole forest ahead of me lit up in an orange glow. I turned around to see if I could find the source of the light, and it disappeared just as suddenly as it had arrived. However, standing behind me in the near darkness was a single deer. The moment I had turned around, I was hit with a stench of death and decomposition. It's so overpowering that I just about hit my knees. And like I said, it wasn't there a moment ago. I knew right away that it was coming from the deer. The creature was thin with ribs protruding through its skin. I was surprised its legs could support its weight. I figured it must be sick of have some type of gangrenous wound on it somewhere to be causing that type of stench. Despite its ill health, it had a rack of antlers spanning twice the width of its body. I almost felt bad for the creature, believing it was most likely sick and very, very old, but there was something else. I couldn't pinpoint the reason then, but I knew there was something else wrong. I tried to shoo the deer away, but it didn't budge. I still had a ways to go to get to my car, and I didn't want to turn my back on it. After failing to scare it away yet another time, I did decide to turn around and head toward my car. As soon as I turned my back, the orange light lit up the sky again. I spun around to face the deer. It was standing in the same place I had left it. I didn't know how, but I knew it had something to do with the light and the unmovable stench of death that filled the air. Its eyes were dark and soulless. What the hell are you? I asked it. And then the orange light returned, glowing bright like the sun behind the deer. The whole forest was now lit with this artificial daylight. The deer then looked at me and began to lift its head as I watched its antlers turn upside down, like they were melting. They looked soft and started dripping, literally melting into the forest floor. But that wasn't all. The creature's fur began to slough off, exposing rotting skin and muscle underneath, and in some places, exposed bone. The skin of its face peeled back and rolled down its neck, like someone put a torch to it. The creature's entire skull was exposed, and its eyes were missing. Its jaw cracked open and fell to the ground, leaving its tongue nowhere to go but to fall in front of its neck. To say I was horrified was an understatement. My hands were shaking so badly that I couldn't get my bear spray out of its holster. I didn't know if the spray would have any effect on this thing, but it was all I had. I took a few stumbling steps backwards, and then the orange light ceased. Darkness fell upon the forest, and the creature standing before me was a deer once again. I had asked it what it was, and it showed me. It revealed its real and total self to me. I wondered what it wanted with me, but I didn't dare ask. I couldn't imagine it was anything good, so I turned and I ran. I don't think I've ever ran that fast before in my life. The creature didn't chase me, and I didn't experience the orange light shining again in the sky. 
Part of me thinks the creature was just screwing with me, because something that could do that could have probably made quick work of me if it wanted to. I don't know why it let me go, but I can tell you one thing for certain, and it's that I am staying the hell out of the forest after dark. I believe in hypnosis. This day and age you have to, don't you think? White line fever kind of made it a thing. It's irrefutable. You know what that is, right? It's that sensation you get after driving for a while, arriving at your destination, only to wonder how exactly you got there. That's a form of hypnosis. Your mind drifts away while your body stays in place, going through the motions with every measure of practice safety. Your body shifts into autopilot. In those instances, you lose maybe 10 minutes of your time. Maybe you've got a long commute and it's 40 minutes or even an hour. There's a limit, you know? Your brain kind of checks in. It pings back into your body to make sure muscle memory hasn't steered you off a cliff or something. In cases like this, it's easy to forgive the 10 minutes of time that you don't remember experiencing. However, I've forgotten more than 10 minutes. I've forgotten three days. Maybe in the span of an entire life, three days doesn't sound like a lot, but it sure is for me. It was not a bender, and it was not some accident. Three days were stolen from me. I remember driving east on I-90, crossing South Dakota. I was on the way home after spending the holiday in Montana. I was only midway through the drive. I wasn't tired yet, but I was alone on the road. My eyes were playing tricks on me, like eyes do. Every pair of headlights cresting over the horizon felt like a big deal. When they were far away and especially small, I found myself hoping that I was coming upon a city. I-90 isn't much to look at, and a city would have helped pass the time. But each time, it was always the light of some other vehicle coming towards me. We passed and then drifted apart in anonymity. That went on for about an hour. Then a trio of blinking lights crested on that horizon all different colors, spaced too far apart to be the front end of a car, blinking, flashing, fading to black. I remember turning down the radio and shifting the lever that cleans my windshield. There was something wrong about those lights. They weren't just coming toward me. They were rising off the ground. They were climbing too high to be a trick of the road. Three lights, yellow, blue, and red. They brightened and dimmed. They started to spin as if each was mounted on the edge of a giant frisbee. I remember under my breath and asking just what I'd found. I remember passing underneath the lights. I remember sticking my head out of the driver's side window to get a better look at the vessel above me. It was as long as two city buses stacked end to end. The strobe of the lights revealed a smooth black metal. There were no connected parts and no seams where the material was bound together. The shape was one solid piece. Another light came down, I think. I remember shielding my eyes from something. I remember slamming on the brakes. If it was another car on the road, there were never any reports. I remember feeling like I was falling. Then I woke up back home. I literally blinked and I was home. Not only home, but I was standing in my local grocery store with a gallon of milk in my hand. I dropped the carton and it ruptured. Milk sloshed over my shoes while I stood there in the aisle. But they weren't the shoes I was wearing in the car. It was daylight out. Not the next day, I soon learned, but three days later. But apparently, I'd arrived home on schedule, if my boss is to be believed. I showed up where I was supposed to when I was supposed to. I spoke to my friends and family. I told everyone all about Montana and described a peaceful drive home. I know it wasn't me speaking, not really. Otherwise, I would have mentioned the lights in the sky. I live my life as normal for those three days, or at least my body did. Autopilot. Auto living. There's no point in doubting whether or not my body was here. Everyone says that it was, so who am I to argue? But that didn't make it right. I saw a doctor about it since I thought I was going crazy. There were no abnormalities in my brain or in my sleeping patterns. Everything psychological was right as rain. I have a new scar though. I found it recently. It's a vertical line down the back of my neck, running parallel to my spine. I asked for an x-ray on it, and I've had surgery, I guess. There's also now a metal plate connecting two of my vertebrae. 
I've seen the scans with my own eyes. I can feel it when I press my fingers against my neck, but it's not supposed to be there. There's no record of that operation. I know there was no auto accident. My car wasn't wrecked and I wasn't hospitalized. If the surgery was performed over those three days, I wouldn't have healed already. Yet what other explanation is there? I saw the lights, I saw the craft, and then I arrived home. I arrived home early, and I lived three days of my life without ever realizing it. I find myself wondering what woke me up, what provoked my brain to check back in on reality in that specific moment. It was just a trip to the grocery store, as far as I could tell. Or were they simply done with me? Did they finish with the body first, and then spend some extra time on the mind? Did they like what they found? Three days is a lot of time. It's a long time to spend without control. It's long enough that it's hard to imagine what my mind was doing while my bones were walking around these streets. Where was I? What was I doing? What was being done to me? I can't get the time back. I know that now. I just need someone to tell me if this is all over. I don't want to be afraid of the lights at the end of the road.